Hello everyone and welcome back. Now, in this lecture and the two that follow it, we're going to start a new topic for this Ordinary Differential Equations class. And in particular, we're going to focus on one of the most important tools that we have for solving differential equations. And that is the Laplace transform. Now the goal of this lecture is to introduce the Laplace transform and let us just see how it works and how we can use it to transform functions from one domain to another. In the next lecture, we're going to see how it can be used to solve ordinary differential equations. But before we get there, we have to have a complete understanding of what the, the Laplace transform is doing and how it works. So, with that being said, let's go ahead and write down what the Laplace transform is. Now, the Laplace transform is an example of one of many integral transforms that can be found in mathematics. We typically use this curvy L to denote a Laplace transform, L standing for Laplace. And this takes in a function we're going to use f of t, so say a function in the time domain, and it spits out a function in the Laplace domain, f of s. And the way it does this is it will take the integral from zero to infinity of your original function that you put in multiplied against this e to the st term. Now notice here that the domain of the Laplace transformed function, so this capital F, its input is the exponent. It's the decay rate on this function f of t. Now of course this is only going to converge as long as this thing goes to zero appropriately fast, right? So we might have to review a little bit of calculus to remind ourselves how this works. But because we have an infinite domain, we have to go to zero as uh, t goes to infinity. Now, this domain of the Laplace function is going to control how we can go to zero. Notice that this whole thing is going to zero, this e to the minus st term. Okay, so it's a little bit funky looking, it's a little bit ugly, but if you just imagine it as taking one function and spitting out another function, that's how you should really think about this. It's a function of functions. We call these things an operator. And in particular, if I give you a particular uh, f of t function, you can do integrals all day, right? You came out of a calculus class to get here, so this should not be a difficulty for you. So let's do it. Let's actually do some examples. Let's take a very, very boring function. f of t is equal to one. Uh, in this case, what is the Laplace transform? Well, my Laplace transform of the constant function one, this is the integral from zero to infinity of e to the minus st dt. Now, the only real nuance that you need when you're working with this is you need to be careful with what is the integration variable. T is the integration variable. The antiderivative of this thing is one over S E to the minus, sorry, minus S T running from zero to infinity. Now at infinity, this thing completely disappears and at zero, the exponential term is equal to one, so I get a Laplace transform of my function, my constant function one, the Laplace transform of that thing is one over s. Okay, so it's just a new function. I'm just using a different variable. This could be one over x, it could be one over y, it could be one over z. I'm just using s to denote the independent variable of the Laplace transformed function. So this is kind of interesting in my opinion because we took a very boring function and got something you know not so boring out of this. Let's try it again. Let's see what happens if we take other exponentials or other functions. And in particular, I want to take an exponential. So let's do e to the at. Well, in this case, we are 
going to just again be integrating an exponential function. So we can see that the Laplace transform of e to the at, this is going to be the integral from zero to infinity of e and then a minus s times t dt. And now what we can see is that when we take the uh, integral of this thing, I get minus one over a minus s e to the a minus s t running from zero to infinity. And now we have some slight difficulties that we need to make sure of. We need to make sure that this thing actually converges to zero at infinity here. And so that is going to require that s is larger than a. That would make this thing negative, which means that I am being pulled down at infinity. And so my final transform here is one over s minus a. So you have to be careful now because my domain of my function is dependent on the decay rate of what is being integrated here or what is being put into this Laplace transform. Now, we can go even further here and we don't even have to put in continuous functions, we can put in step functions. So let's look at this one, f of t is equal to, now I've got the, uh, the constant value one when t is between zero and one. I've got a spike k when, let's do t is equal to one. And I've got zero when t is greater than one. Now, what does this function actually look like? Well, this thing is going to take this form. It's going to have the constant value one all the way up to one here. And then the constant value zero all the way from t greater than one. So I have a jump here. And maybe if we assume that k is up here, for example, then you have holes in your function at each of these endpoints, right? At the joining point t equal to one. But what we know is that that doesn't matter for when we start taking Laplace transforms. So if I did the Laplace transform of this function, well, what I would get is, so just writing the definition for a moment, e to the minus s times t f of t dt, this is going to give me, now I can move over the domains, this piece in the middle doesn't show up, right? Because it doesn't have any width, it's just a spike. And when we're doing Riemann sums, we would never see this k term showing up. So what we do is we subdivide the integral from zero to one, where my function is e to the minus s times t times one, that's this, dt, and then plus the integral, sorry, from one to infinity of e to the minus s t, and then times zero dt, right? Because my function is zero beyond that. So this piece completely disappears. So let's put a line through it. This is equal to zero. And so now I've got myself in a position where I've got a relatively easy little integral that can be computed here. I get one minus e to the minus s over s. And again, this is only for s greater than zero that this is actually going to work. Okay, let's do one more. This is kind of a fun one. So let's see what we can do with this one. So let's look at this example. Okay, let's say f of t is equal to sine of a times t, where a does not equal to zero. 
So A is some constant. I do not care what it is. I can handle any value of A all at the same time here. But let's see what the Laplace transform of this thing is going to be. Okay, let's actually switch up the colors. So I've got the Laplace transform of sine of AT. Well, let's write what this actually looks like. This is E to the minus S times T sine of AT DT. Okay, so that is a very ugly integral, but you might remember from your calculus class how to solve this thing. Right? It's typically a famous example that we use in, in integral calculus classes because you have to use integration by parts twice. But let me show you how to do it. Um, if I apply integration by parts here, here's what I will get. So first, I get e to the minus s times t cos of at divided by a, and this is going to be evaluated at zero and infinity, and then minus s over a, the integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus s times t, uh, cos of at dt. Okay, now what I can do is I can compute this Again, under the assumption that s is greater than zero, this is sort of a domain of definition for my Laplace transform. So if, the, if s is bigger than zero, this thing disappears at infinity, life is good, and so that only the, the only piece that matters is what happens at zero, which is giving us one over a. And then what we can do is we can still have this piece on the end, s over a, the integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus s times t, cos of a t, dt. Okay, what we will do is we will integrate by parts again. I'm gonna go ahead and do it all in one step for you. So I showed you how you do it in you know, the long way here. Let me go ahead and just do integration by parts now and simplify everything up. In fact, what you get is s squared over a squared. Now the integral from zero to infinity, e to the minus s times t sine of a t. And this is what I meant about this being a famous integral because it's one of those integrals where if you use integration by parts twice, you get exactly the same integral back. Look at e to the minus st times sine of at, e to the minus st times sine of at. So I'm going to sort of finish it off in this little blurb right here. But essentially what this gives me is it says that the Laplace transform of s, or, or sorry, of sine of at is equal to one over a minus s squared over a squared times the Laplace transform of sine of a t. So what I can do is I can isolate for the Laplace transform of sine of a t. And what this gives me is it gives me a over s squared plus a squared. So all I'm doing is isolating for these two terms. And of course, we have this domain of definition, S over A. Now, what you're probably wondering here is what's the big deal, right? What's so interesting about the Laplace transform? Well, what I want you to notice is that in three of my examples, one, two, and three, I have turned a function, in this case an exponential, in this case a sinusoidal function, into a rational function. That is pretty interesting because I think that you might agree with me that rational functions are typically a little bit easier to work with, right? We spend a lot of introductory calculus courses learning how to work with rational functions. We learn about looking for singularities, we, look at, we learn about sketching them, their domains, their ranges, all kinds of nice properties. 
And then what we try and do is leverage that understanding to way more complicated functions. Well, look at what the Laplace transform does for you. It says you give me a function, I give you some other function, but in a lot of the functions that I care about, exponentials, constants, signs, it gives me something that I can work with, right? It transforms me into this, this new way of looking at the function. And in particular, what it gives me is these nice rational functions. Now, what's even more than that? The Laplace transform satisfies a linearity property. So let me just finish off by writing it here so I don't have to uh, erase the board. But basically, if I take the Laplace transform of a linear combination of functions, well, this is the same as the linear combination of Laplace, tra uh, of Laplace transforms of those functions. So just like all of those ODEs that I've been working with, where they have this principle of superposition, the Laplace transform has it too. So this is nice, right? This allows me, you know, if I wanted to find the Laplace transform of 1 plus e to the at uh, minus sine of at, all I would have to do is sum up the answers from these previous examples, or sum these two and subtract this one. It's not that bad, right? It's a beautiful property of this thing. So what we're going to come back with in the next lecture is we're going to show why this is useful for solving differential equations. Essentially what we'll see is that it takes what could be a high order linear differential equation, turns it into an algebraic equation. We can solve algebraic equations and so that's what we're going to look at in the next section.